Proud Canadian William Shatner has just put out a new collection of essays titled Boldly Go Reflections on a Life of Awe and Wonder. In it, he is sharing stories and insights from his 91 years here on this blue earth and the 10 minutes he spent in space, which I find super fascinating. To talk about it all, I'm pleased to say William Shatner joins me now over Zoom from Los Angeles. How are you? Good. Uh, I've I've been uh, hustling this book for a while. Uh, several days. So I'm a little dazed. And what happens in these multitude, and you're my last interview, so I can sort of relax. Uh-huh. And you're funny and, and you're obviously bright. Uh-huh. Uh, I, I'm already softening you up. Oh, yeah, I appreciate that. I appreciate it. I'm going to get rid of all my hard questions now. Later, <laughs> right. so yeah, yeah, I uh, I, 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 uh, I'm tired. And there are times when I start to tell a familiar story. And what goes through my mind is, wait a minute. Did I tell him that story if I... Have I said that story to him yet? Uh, I mean, like, I don't know whether I've repeated the story. Like, so am I telling it to you twice? It's a little dazzling. I can see that. Can, can, I, can I get a story off you off the top, though? Because the, the, the yeah. beginning of this book I find really, really interesting. You start with visiting with sharks underneath the, the water. Uh, you're at the bottom of the ocean. You're commuting and communicating with tiger sharks. Why did you want to start the book there? I've had a series of adventures that are, I guess, if not unique, they're unusual because people want to put me on their program or, you know, I happen to be around. I was walking down the street. and the Whatever it is, I've had the opportunity to have the thrill of risking my life uh, safely. So it's, in some instances, it was downright idiotic. But in other instances, there's enough guardrails around that I don't think I'm going to die. And and so it was with the sharks. I'm with experts. But when they brought a five-foot shark and put it in my lap, uh, and I'm petting it, and everybody else is wearing chain mail, and I'm not, I'm thinking, what's, uh, you know, maybe I should get out of here. And I've just had the opportunity to to do these things that required me to say, oh, screw it, I'm, I'm going to do it and go and do it. I tell you what I'm struck by there is that the, I think for people who would be underneath the water, especially at the beginning of the book, um, uh, would be underneath the water with, with sharks, they would be described, Bill, as fearless. The thing that I get from this book is that you're not. You, you, no. you, you have the fear. Yes. Well, you... If you don't have the fear, you're not doing anything unusual. If you don't think you're going to die, you think, oh, look at that, 18-foot tiger shark. Da, 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 da. What else I got to do today? That's uh, Then that's not an adventure. It's an adventure if you think, holy cat, I saw, I saw a shark 18, about 18 inches wide mouth and go whoop, towards the cameraman. And this Bahamian went, whoop, pushed it aside, 18 foot. Yeah. I mean, it was startling. What, what makes it worthwhile for you? Because I think early in the book, you say something like, I want to learn something new every, every day. I mean, the thing I get from this story and some of the stories we're going to tell today is there is a bit of a curiosity off you that feels different than your everyday I, I curiosity. I a bit. I think it's overwhelming curiosity. Yeah. I've heard acting described as, curiosity about the human condition is that so is it that same curiosity that brings you to acting pretty pretty, uh, pompous (laughs) (laughs) acting is saying somebody else's words out loud and the louder (laughs) and the more energy you can put into it the better you are you know you're saying somebody else's words as an actor unless you have a purpose and a curiosity about how would this guy say that word I I was playing this role on television, and it was a great role. And what was and it? What one? What one? Uh, uh, um, um, Denny Crane. Uh-huh. So I'm playing Denny Crane in uh, in uh, Boston Legal, and every so often, David E. Kelly, this genius writer, would write, "Cue the music." I'd say to the director, "I, I don't. You got any idea of what I'm saying here?" He said, "I don't know." Well, who am I saying cue the music to? Do I say it to the camera? Do I say it to the guy I'm talking to? Cue the music. Comes out of nowhere. 
I said, I don't know. So I tried it every which way. I tried looking at the camera, cue the music, uh, cue the music. But on the last show, I, I think he must have found it as well, because he must have heard that I was wondering, how do I say cue the music? Talk about David Kelly. Kelly writes, I've all for this character say, I've always thought of my life as a television show. Of course. He's saying to the world, I'm in my own television show. Cue the music, I'm ready, I'm on. The explanation is right there. So I had an insight into this character that wasn't there before. Had I thought of it, had, if I had had the intelligence to think of that before, I could have done more. I would have known more about the character. Do you follow? Am I being clear at all? You're, 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 you're being very, very clear. You have, you have this line in your script that is cue the music, and you say it over and over and over again, and you're saying to yourself, I don't know why this line is in here, and you're saying it every which way, but it never seems to work. And at the end of Boston Legal, David E. Kelly, the writer, says to you, oh, it uh, turns out this guy thinks he's in a television show all the time. So he is saying cue the music to, uh, to a, 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 a non-existent music director. An invented audience, an invented right. music director. Right. What I'm hearing from so I hear what you're saying. What I'm hearing from that though is not what you were saying about. I know you're being glib. An actor trying, an actor's job is to say other people's lines and say it because you don't strike me as the person because you've been acting since what? How you were how old? Six. So you were six years old and you've been acting. And you got really really passionate about it when you were you know early on. That doesn't strike me as someone who did that because he liked to say other people's lines. You don't strike me as someone who liked to do that because he liked saying other people's lines. But sometimes people get so pompous about what they're doing. They say, Jesus Christ, come out of your, come out of your uh, dressing room. Just get, put, get, put some powder on his nose, will you? And just say, what is it you say? You say, yes. There was an actress uh, in Star Trek who had to say no. And the director made her say it 19 times. Just say no. And I don't know what went wrong and whether he was being cruel or whether he was not getting what he wanted. I don't know. All I know is this actress had to say no 19 times. And everybody talked about it. She said 19 times. She said no. No, 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 no. I mean, what did she do? So there is a among some of the practitioners a pomposity that doesn't belong there. You write very honestly about your relationships with the other Star Trek castmates in this book, by the way. Yeah. Not always in a flattering way to yourself, if you don't mind me saying. No. One's perception of, one's perception of oneself and somebody else's perception of you is either a little bit different or completely different. So I'm thinking, God, I've got... 10 pages of words to learn, and I got 10 pages of words to learn for tomorrow, and I've got all this publicity I got to do at lunch and before and after that, and I'm busy. And meanwhile, people who have less words to say come in only on occasion, are laughing and joking on the side uh, behind the camera, and, uh, and I don't have time. I literally don't have time for that. I go to my dressing room, I come here, I get back. So I'm not social, amenable. I'm there. I've got a lot of work to do. That's my perception of their description of me. I th I read a lot of uh, memoirs from people who put a certain amount of rose-colored glasses on their own lives, and I thought yeah. it, I thought it was good to have someone be honest about ways they maybe they, they could have been a little I don't know ways they were a little self-critical of themselves, and that was nice. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask you about this, and I wanted to save some time to make sure I, I asked you about this. I, I got to talk to you. I think I got to talk to you for that now. My God, the name of the movie escapes me. It was the movie where you, you, you played a fella who was like refusing to grow up, and you were still driving around a sports car. Do you remember this movie? Yeah. 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 yeah I, I talked to you. I talked to you about that, and I'd say like a few months after I talked to you, and that was the first time I ever talked to you. I was watching TV when I watched the um, the Jeff Bezos rocket launch go into air, right? And I said to myself, oh, my God, William Shatner, a guy I talked to a few months ago, is about to go into space. Really exciting, right? So when I was watching it all happen and uh, I was excited for you and I saw you come off the, I saw you come off the spaceship 
and everyone was doing jumping jacks and was excited and popping champagne. And you looked like you had had a transformational moment. And I remember watching you on screen grab onto the head of Amazon, Jeff Bezos, and you were saying something so intently tearful to him. And so then when I pick up the book, I'm not going to lie to you, I skip ahead to that part because I'm excited to see what happened. Do you want to do? Do you want to say what happened? Is that you? You saw, you had a, a really transformational moment when you saw Earth in yeah. space. Uh, the, th- I, I, I think the ending of my life is going to be me trying to bring attention to global warming, uh, more so. Uh, you know, make my contribution. And what I saw up there with the how unfriendly space looked and how warm and nourishing the earth looked. Instead of saying, oh, wow, life, I, I must have gone, because I didn't realize it until hours after I had landed, I must have gone, my God, it's all dying. It's all dying. All this gorgeous thing, this beautiful earth, it's taken five billion years to evolve. And it's dying. Hold on. Help me explain this a little bit better. So you're in the, sh- you're in the, sh- the rocket. The rocket goes to... In, in, in up, to in the air. up in the air, past, right? Past the Carmen line. Yeah. And you see out one side space. And you would think that you, you would see this awe of, wow, look at the vastness of the universe. But you say you, exactly. see, you see death, you say, when you see out there. Yeah, because there were no twinkling stars and 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 uh, uh, and the receding constellations it was black black so you're, you're I mean, you, that's what you black. see from space right that's what i saw and you turn around you look at earth and what do you see there I don't know, beige blue white clouds curvature small little rock it's a small little rock we came through the blue air it's paper thin the air it's a thin, thin, it's onion skin, air. That's all we got. That's what we're breathing. That's what we're spewing all this poison into, paper skin. And not only is it paper skin, what's usable, I'm a pilot that isn't current at the moment, but the first thing you're taught is you can't go above 12,500 feet without oxygen because you can't live beyond 12,500 feet. Yeah. There's a, a death zone as you ascend past 12.5. So of the 50 miles of air, there's only 12,000 feet that are usable, two miles of usable air. That's all we've got. That's what, when somebody blew up the methane pipelines uh, in Nord 2, uh, and all that methane is gone through the you're bubbling up through the ocean and into the air. When the spaceship lands. Oh, I love that term. Say it again. When the spaceship lands, you are you are taken by the fragility of a world that you got to see from a very rare perspective. That's exactly right. And because I have studied and read and uh, you know, Silent Spring and all that kind of thing. I know I know more than most people <clears throat> about incidences of extinction, which is the final thing, you know. And the, then, the final frontier. Well, yeah. if you wish, the and then there are moments where, like the condors here in Southern California, where they place them back, like they're extinct. There are only a few in in the zoo, and then they let them go. And now there's like a hundred and. 50 of them or so. So there, mankind has the possibility of renewing the stuff that mankind has snuffed out. So I know something about the fragility of the earth. And I could see it more clearly from space. And rather than thinking uh, death life, I was mourning, I realized. I was in grief for this... the beauty of the of the earth that I worship. Does going to space do anything to you existentially about your own mortality, about your own death? Well, I've always been hyper, well, I've been aware. I don't know 
you know, everybody's aware they're going to die, but there comes a time. We have somebody in our family who's uh, fighting uh, cancer. And so the first time in their lives, they holy shit, my God, I could die. I've been th thinking about that for quite a while. But when a young person says, oh, my God, I could die, it becomes a, a shock. Yeah. Whereas when you're three, when you start to gain consciousness, you should be saying, what, what happens when I die? Because you die so quickly. Yeah, I've got to make my life mean something to me because you got like about 50 years, useful years, 60, whatever that would be, where you can use your, what you have to help, to not help, to destroy, to make whole, to live your life. No time at all. Boom, bam, boom, boom. What do you mean it's over? Can you imagine somebody who's conscious enough dying? Saying, I don't want to leave. I know that's what's going to happen. I don't want to go. I haven't done anything yet. Can you imagine the terror? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, d does does going to space? I, I would think that maybe going to space and seeing the, the 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 smallness of our world might give you some peace. Might give you some perspective. Well, it's not peace. I mean, it's still so small. What what am I doing on this little rock? And I'm this little thing called a human being on this little rock, and we're non-entities. We're a, 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 a innocuous planet and a kind of mediocre sun in a in a, a constellation that's kind of way in the in the outskirts of the the Milky Way is nothing, and there are billions like it. We're, we're nothing. And that's when, about a day later, it occurred to me, yeah, we're nothing, but we're aware that we're nothing. And we're aware of the awe and majesty of space and the mystery of life and the, all the things everybody's talked about since time immemorial. We're nothing, but we're something. That's a, this, that's um, there, that's um, that makes me feel a sense of gratitude. Good. It makes me feel like I'm I'm uh, if it's send if me it, send me flowers, chocolates, anything. Cash. <laughs> cash. I'll buy my own chocolates. <laughs> I'll send you. I'll send you an Amazon gift card. How about that, Bill? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but I, I got to tell you though, you're doing pretty well at ninety one. Yeah. Why? Why do Canadians? Yeah. Why do I ask my sisters? Yeah. How, you, how are you feeling, Joy? And she says, "Not bad." That's a Canadian thing. Well, what do you mean, not bad? Is that good or is that bad? You know. So there's always a conditional on everything. You know, pretty good. It's not pretty good. It's really damn good. You know what? I'll try to be more effusive in the future, Bill. How about that? No. Just more declarative. You seem to be doing extremely well for ninety-one. See, see, you seem to be doing. <laughs> you are doing extreme. You are thriving now, and doing now. extremely well at 91. There. Now that's a declarative, unconditioned uh, statement that Canadians, as a, as a rule, have a great deal of trouble doing. How's the country doing? Pretty good. What do you mean pretty good? It's the only country worth living in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that declarative statement just cost me my job. The CBC is listening to that going, that was a little too forceful with the Shatner interview, to be honest. But you are. Is your job in I wouldn't think your job is in jeopardy. You're really good at what you do. Oh, stop it, Bill. And I'm not only like that, yeah. wait a minute. Yeah. You're cute. You. Uh, <laughs> how old are you? Uh, th uh, 35. Really? Yeah. So were you an actor to begin with? No, no, musician. What What kind? Folk music. I'm from Newfoundland, so folk musician. <laughs> You mean Newfoundland doesn't have a pianist? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we lost one on the boat on the way over. No, I, 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 I banjos and guitars and all that. Banjo and guitar. Yeah, and yeah. singing. Singing and banjo and guitar. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, we're, we're very proud of you up here. You know that? Are you really? Yeah. yeah. Well. I'm, In Canada. King Canada is very proud of you. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm delighted. I, I, I feel very Canadian. What does that mean? 
means that there's a definite difference when you get off the airplane in Vancouver or Toronto. I was in Saskatchewan recently. It's just different. It's People are different. And I never thought that until I began to look at it more closely. And yeah, there's a little more politeness, a little, except for the Canadian customs. They are so rude. It's so bad to have people coming into the country and face the first view of their country, of that country, Canada, are these guys that just, you know, they shove a, a rod up your rear end to examine you. It's, 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 what do you, I'm not carrying a gun up there for God's sake. I'm Captain Kirk for loving honor of God. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I feel like saying. <laughs> Uh, I really, I really enjoyed reading the book. Okay, we're yeah. going to examine that sentence as oh, well. Oh, for God's sake! How about how about this? I, I, I pretty much enjoyed reading the book. Is that what you want? <laughs> I really enjoyed. Yep. I enjoyed declarative. Hold you on, you don't need all these conditional words. Isn't really enjoyed better than enjoyed? Maybe. If you mean it that way, it's, that's the way. i tell you one uh, thing. I really enjoyed talking to you today. <laughs> I've had a good time. <laughs>